The story of Australia's first peoples is the oldest continuing human story on Earth. Through countless generations of songlines, to connection with country and spirit, to resistance, struggle and survival, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander story is vast, inspiring and always evolving. This podcast series presents a collection of First Peoples voices, sharing their experiences, achievements, hopes and beliefs. These are the real stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. I'm May Rasanta and you're listening to The Real Podcast Series. In this episode, I chat with Kalgoorlie-born actor Maine Wyatt. Theatre work has included Silent Disco, The Buried City, Gloria, Black Diggers, King Lear and the lead role in Peter Pan, which toured New York in 2013. His film credits include The Sapphires, What If It Worked and The Turning. On the small screen, Maine has appeared in Redfern Now, for which he was nominated for an Actor Award, and he's also played a recurring role as Nate on Neighbours. Thank you very much for coming in to our office, 33 HQ, aka The Real Studio, um, after four. (laughs) Oh, good. It's it's good to be here. Um, And it's your first time to the office and your first podcast, I believe. Yes, this is my first podcast, so... um Take it easy on me. (laughs) (laughs) You take it easy on me and we'll get through this together. But um, a little bit about The Real. Um, We've obviously got a website and we just wanted to have real conversations with deadly young black people Mm -hmm. about experiences that we have every day. Yeah, cool. Um, So keeping it real, having chats about um, life, what we're uh, goals, aspirations, challenges, where we're going next, um, lessons that we can teach some of the younger ones coming through interesting ideas, books, whatever it is. So yeah. there's no kind of awesome. set rule to this. Yeah, um, awesome. And hopefully we'll be able to share with Australia, the world, whoever's listening a little <laughs> bit more about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that's not just negative things that you see in mainstream media all the time. Yeah, too good. Um, and so how we always like to get our guests to introduce themselves because everyone's got their bio and we've seen you on different things, but I also find people and how they like to represent themselves is very different. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Uh, My name is Maine White. I'm originally from Kalgoorlie. Um, I'm a Wangatha on my mum's side and I'm a Yamaji on my dad's side. So um, I'm Western Australian represent. um, And I grew up in Western Australia and then once I'd finished high school and I did the one year Aboriginal theatre course at uh, WAPA. Mm-hmm. I then moved to Sydney and I did the three-year acting course at NIDA and then I've been here pretty much ever since. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is where the, most of the acting work is and this is where the industry thrives the most. So I think um, I've been here for 12 years now. So this is why I'm here. Um, it's been a long time since you've been here, but I've been to Kalgoorlie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a beautiful country. Yep. <laughs> um, I was there for a youth festival once, and I, it's quite different in the West Coast for people who haven't been there. Can you describe the home for us? Well, I think Kalgoorlie is a bit of a um, cowboy town. It's it's very uh, dry, desert, um, but it's also has its it's it's has its warts. I think so. Racism is very prevalent in the town, mm-hmm. um, but it's a it's a mining town, and I have very um, fond memories growing up there. And my extended family live there still. My mum now lives in Perth with my brother and sisters, but I grew up in Kalgoorlie, and I've I've really loved the place, and it's really beautiful. But yeah, it also has its um, dark side as well. And I think um, it just recently, all the, the in the last couple of years, I think. Uh, some of those dark things have come up to come into the mainstream media, but it's always been there. So I think it's now time that people are looking at that place and what it represents in, in Australia as a whole, I suppose. But it, it is, yeah, it is beautiful. Of those parts. Yeah, no, it is um, a difficult conversation to have mm-hmm. at times because there are pockets that people wouldn't know that these sorts of attitudes you know that racism exists mm. quite full-on um, as a kind of light-skinned aboriginal person i mm. get to walk the streets of Kalgoorlie and have a very different experience mm. and you can see some of your brothers and sisters you know being on the street or being treated yeah. very differently and it's heartbreaking to kind of know that your mob's being treated like yeah. that um so have you been home the last few years and experienced that more recently how's the town doing um i think last year i was there for my grandmother's funeral um so i was only there for a few days but I think there's a very, I think there was a time I was there a little bit prior, maybe the year before, and I think um, 
the incident um, and the court case around Elijah Dowdy had was just maybe six months or something so before, and the release of of that man. Um, so I think. There was a certain tension in the air and you could feel it and you could feel it between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous and no matter where you went, I think it, it, the tension was high and it was already high when <laughs> growing up kind of thing and then this just a- actually increased it a lot. So the attitudes, uh, when you just look on Facebook and all those kinds of things, you can see the comments and the divide um, within the community but it also you could feel it in the air and there was something about being in a town that was just very tense. And it's very painful. Mm, very, very much so. Um, especially because it's kind of a, uh, a slap in the face, really, um, because of what had happened to that guy. And I think he got out after 15 months. Um, and at first, it, it was, he didn't get a murder charge. He didn't get manslaughter. He got reckless driving and he got out on parole after 15 months. So it was, um, yeah, it was a devastating um, result, I think. And I think... Uh, yeah, but it, it was an insult to Indigenous Australia as a whole. And it's institutional, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, it's that bias that exists that people don't even realise exists. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, as an Aboriginal person, I feel like you can always feel it coming mm-hmm. most of the time before it comes. Yeah, And if you can walk in a room and you can go, mm, I can feel it in this room. Yeah. And I, I think there's a certain, like, I think at some point you have some optimism there and you sit there and go, actually, maybe it won't, maybe it won't and... You, you, I suppose you're not um, surprised, but you are shocked that it still happens. And it's going, when is it going to change? When are people going to care enough? And I think care is a, uh, a big deal um, with non-Indigenous Australia in terms of Indigenous issues. Because I think people don't really... If it doesn't affect them in their small, in their, in their own personal way, then... Why would it bother them any other way? I think, and I think at, at when people go, "Oh, um, my friend's Aboriginal," my my what or whatever, my partner or this or that, it's it, it becomes a personal thing. But if you don't, if you're not exposed to that world, then you don't have an opinion at all. And the only thing you hear is negative media, negative social media, negative responses, and those kind of um, unfortunate stereotypes that invade our community. And you mentioned there are times when you're hopeful that mm. it won't happen. Have you been surprised and at different times been, um, you know, grateful that it didn't happen or um, has there been a circumstance where people have had a really mature conversation about race with you? I, th- I think um, most people are pretty open. I, I, I have to say I surround myself with people that are usually um, my friends in the industry and they tend to be lefties and... Uh, allies and stuff like that you'll get the odd conversation where you go okay I have to educate you in a certain area and that can be exhausting because sometimes you don't want to (laughs) and um, it's not your job you know what I mean and having to be a teacher all the time is is exhausting and sometimes I don't feel like doing that and if you if you are saying something that is um, ignorant then sometimes you deserve the full brunt of a, a, a response that I don't, I don't want to comfort and coddle you because it's just racist. And if you haven't educated yourself by this point, then you need to, I feel. Um, so I think there's sometimes... I, if you catch me on a good day, I might sit there and we'll have a conversation over a cup of coffee or whatever. But then if you caught me on a bad day and then I just go, no, I don't want to have this conversation and go up the creek, <laughs> then that's what you're going to get. Mm. It's true. It can be exhausting being an Aboriginal person, just constantly kind of walking around and trying to protect your space. Um, yes. And, and make sure that you've got a healing space around you so that you're not bombarded by external... Um, well, especially if it happens to you all the time. And if it happens to you on a weekly basis, it, it's, it's not something that... W- I think a lot of people see when we react to something as an overreaction. But you don't know how my week's been. You don't know how many things have happened to me in my life for this to pile up. And then when I do snap and get upset with you, that, that's, that's an, acu- a, an accumulation of all those times where I've sat there and been quiet. I've, I've, I've walked into uh, a store and the security guard followed me around the shop. I've, I've walked into a cafe and been there first, but get served second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, waiting at a taxi rank and watch it drive 
up slowly, look at you, and then speed off. Once, twice, three times in one night. So um, <laughs> if you caught me in a time where I don't feel like it and I don't feel like taking it, then you're going to get the response that, it <laughs> unfortunately, you're going to get the full brunt of all of that accumulated. Yeah. And people know that when you're have, having a bad week, all of a sudden you can <laughs> yep. snap at anything. It's yep. just this is a layer that kind of exists mm-hmm. for First Nations people mm. um, around the country. And, uh, we hope that we can change that perhaps by doing um, various things, having conversations like this yep. on the podcast, creating great works, um, mm-hmm. which I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what you've got coming up. But before we get there, I'd like to um, pick your brain a little bit about your time studying acting. What even drew you to acting in the start? I think when I was, I think there was always a time when I was, I must have been about four or five or something, and then I kind of knew that I was going to be an actor. And I think it, I banked it for a long time, and I was like, oh, I want to play footy, or I want to do what my friends are doing, or this and that. And, um, at four or five, that's really <laughs> young. How did you know it at that age? Um, I think I just loved f- movies, and I think my parents were really um, exposed me to that industry really early, and I think I always enjoyed it. and my uncle, um, and I know like um, one guy way, and my people, one guy, um, my uncle is an actor. And what we believe is that if someone um, rubs you when you're a baby, you take on certain traits of that, per- for that person. And then when I was born, my uncle grabbed me first and he was an actor. So I think that w- rubbed onto me. And then, you know, I think that's, that's, that's our little uh, black fellow superstition. <laughs> um, but I think um, also I, it just it was something that I always knew that I wanted to do. And, I, and growing up, I was always the class clown and um, <laughs> probably a little bit too much. I should have been learning more but it didn't matter anyway because I became an actor um so I think I always enjoyed drama I was part of a dance troupe called the Muggle Dancers in Kalgoorlie um and then once I'd finished high school I did yeah I did the one year Aboriginal theatre course at WAPA but I was going to go and study broadcasting and journalism so at Edith Cowan but I deferred that course and I went it's not like the Aboriginal theatre course is not going to help if I go in down that path because I think there's a certain uh, present, presentational theatricality to broadcasting and presenting and sports broadcasting, journalism. And um, I think I just did the Aboriginal theatre course just to, you know, see where that was going to take me. But at the end of it, I auditioned for Whopper and NIDA and I got into both. And then I went, Perth, Sydney, Perth, Sydney. I went to Sydney. So, um, yeah, it was a big step. And I must have been 17, 18 at the time. So, but, um, yeah, I, I was excited by it. Yeah, I bet it was exciting. What films did you used to watch as a kid that um, you kind of went, yeah, I'm going to be an actor? Oh, look, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty cheesy now that I think about it, but when I was a kid, I really loved Jim Carrey and I used to, you know, I have a stupid elastic face, so um, he was kind of my, like, uh, go-to man about that kind of stuff and I always wanted to be funny and stuff like that. But Because at the time, he was in The Mask and Ace Ventura and all those ridiculous films. But, um, yeah, he, he was kind of one of the people that I really like, looked up to at that time when I was a kid. But then as I got on older, um, I think I, I started getting into more serious films and serious acting and stuff like that. So um, I think it's... Uh, oh, look, I, I, can, I can never say what my favourite film is or even my top ten, I suppose. I, it's like a, a good 50, I reckon. Um, and you just take the bits from yeah. different people that you yeah. like. Yeah, I can, I can sure. see the Jim Carrey kind of <laughs> comparison. I remember the first time I met you was um, when you were playing Peter Pan and the mm. childlike kind of yeah. um, uh, physicality that you had to bring to that role. I can kind of see the yeah. similarities there. Yeah, well, I still haven't grown up, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so how was it at NIDA? I auditioned for both schools um, and I got into both and then I was fortunate enough to have that choice of, you know, Perth or Sydney and then I chose Sydney. And, yeah, I did the three-year course at NIDA. I think it's a place... Uh, that isn't for everyone. I think some people go in as good actors and come out not as good, and then some people go in and become good actors after it. So I, I think it's a so you got to take it individual, and I think some people unfortunately take it as uh, the gospel, and they let the place and it, because it's a subject me, subjective medium, it's not an exact science. You know, it's, people's tastes are going to differ different differentiate between other people you know um and i think my experience i took everything that was said to me to a grain of salt because um some things were said to me that was actually negative 
Um, and it had a lot to do with not my acting, but just, um, well, me as a person, I suppose. And I think uh, just recently, in the last week or so, some of those things have come up again because a conversation had been made about myself, uh, Nakia Louie and Shari Sevens, and we all... Um, shut that conversation down because it was had, had to do with Captain Cook or something and it was on social media. But then, and this was coming from someone who was a teacher at the school and I decided to go, no, actually, you don't know how you treated us. And I made that uh, a public thing on Facebook because I just went, I'm going to expose you because that's that's what it is, you know. And I think, I think at, at the time I, I just went... That's nothing, because what I've grown up with, living in Kalgoorlie, I've had worse things said to me. So if this is the best you got, this is going to be a walk in the park. So um, I went in there with a really thick skin, and I took most of the things. I went, you know, out of that um, crap criticism, I'm going to get something constructive out of it. But I also just went, I'm going to take this. I don't, I didn't read everything and make it the gospel. You know what I mean? I just went, I don't need that. That's unnecessary. Oh, that that's interesting. Or oh, I could use that in the future. Or if, so there was there was good elements about it, and there was um, not so good elements about it. And I think um, it, it depends on the individual. Um, it's it's not a place that I, I, you don't need to go to. I've worked with more actors that are uh, untrained than trained, and if you believe in yourself and you are instinctual and you, you're professional, then you're going to succeed. And if that's what you want to do, then just do it. It doesn't need to. But if you also are a person that wants to get studying and training, go for it. Audition for those bigger schools. But I, I think what I've found is that um, I would still be in this position even if I didn't go through those courses. So um, I, I just have that self-confidence. I think. Yeah, I think you definitely need that. And we're from mm. the, you know, oldest storytellers <laughs> yeah. in the world and there are different ways to go about mm-hmm. your journey through yeah. life and education For and sure. people who influence you and those you go, yep, I'll take a bit of that, but mm-hmm. no thanks very much. And yeah, I think it's definitely true that we shouldn't take... Um, a, a certain line or a certain way through mm. to becoming who we want to be because yeah, who sure. you want to be in your head is very different to what people think you might want to be. Yeah, and you don't. You should be yourself. I feel, and and I don't think you should let anybody influence you that is negative. And we're really grateful for that mm-hmm. because um, now we've got a really vibrant, flourishing Indigenous theatre yes. kind of... Um, it has been around for a while, but there's mm-hmm. so many great works coming out, yep. so many talented actors, playwrights, um, creatives that are wrapping around that scene and mm. we're just pumping out some amazing works across the board. Yeah, and it's about time too. You know, I, th- I think uh, those doors haven't always been open, so I think th- uh, it's, um, it's great that uh, people are starting to... Um, push on and about the importance of diversity and especially indigenous stories as you know like you said we, we, we've been st- storytelling for a very very long time so i think it's about time that our stories are pushed to the forefront and what do you think changed i think it was an international attitude that had influenced um i think overseas diversity has been pushed forward a lot more than it has in australia and i think that's affected our stories and Australian stories just as a as a whole and then indigenous stories you've got directors and cinematographers and producers and actors and creatives in all mediums pushing forward and and it's about time like I said before you know um I I think that door hasn't always been open and now we're just going well if it's shut then we're just going to bust it open you know what I mean um I think for a long time it it you only had a handful. You had all of those pioneers that were before myself and everyone around today and there was only... You could probably put 10 on your, you know, both hands, as many that uh, that there were. But then there was also the people that were behind the scenes and pushing for that black theatre film movement. But it's taken a very, very long time. And I think um, last year when... I was at the um, Screen Australia um, 25, 25, 25 years? Yeah, 25 years. And it was like, wow, that's only 25 of over 80,000 years of storytelling. You know what I mean? So I think <laughs> that's not even a, you know, not even a drop in the 
ocean. So I think we've still got to push our stories. And I, like I said before, it's about time. And I think uh, it's a very exciting time as well. And why do you think it's important to share our stories? Because we're the first people <laughs> of this country. And not only that, I think um, we have a very deep pool of stories to tell. And I think no one's told them like we have. I think a lot of the time we've always had uh, influence from um, uh, Western storytelling on our work. And I think we're slowly but surely breaking those barriers and creating work in our way and our own way. And I think that's very important. And it's coming from our voice because no matter how much someone is trying to apply that pressure or being a good ally, it's always watered down, I find. And I think our stories coming from our mouths is the best way to go about it. Um, And I bet there's been times when you've had to kind of push back and try and ensure that it's not watered down. And Mm -hmm. how do you handle that sort of situation? And how do you keep pushing to make sure our stories are as real as they can be? I think being the best professional that you can possibly be in, in your particular field, but also not taking no for an answer and make and being as loud as possible and making sure that your ideas, your vision, your views are, are at the forefront. And I think um, I've made sure in my particular work that I'm going to have my input. This is a collaboration, no matter what, film, television, theatre, I'm always going to have my input and I'm not a pawn in your chess game. You know what I mean? I think having that confidence and self-confidence to go, no, actually, I've done my homework. I know my stuff. I know my story. And I'm pushing this forward because I think this is what you need to hear. And I have not heard this before. I have not heard my story. I've watched millions of shows and TVs and um, films and that. And I'm going like, oh, yeah, that's a version of me. But this isn't me. So I'm going to give you a version of me. I haven't seen before. I want to do a show that I want to see. So here, I'm going to give you that. And so tell us about it. It's coming <laughs> up. Um, City of Gold. So it's, um, I'd, I'd just been writing for the last two years and this is my first play, uh, City of Gold. Um, it's about Kalgoorlie, hence the title because they mine gold in Kalgoorlie, City of Gold. So um, a little play on words there, but also it's a play... Um, in 2015, my father passed and I went, um, I'll, you know, going through that grief and that mourning period, I came to a point where I fell out of love with acting and I was going for big auditions and stuff like that and I just didn't have the confidence that I once had. I think that something um, had changed in me. But then there was also something that changed in my career and my work. I felt like um, a lot of... Th- auditions I was going for or um, if people were asking for my availabilities and um, they were sending projects to go, what do you think about this and that? And I just felt like I had, it was a lot of repetition and a lot of things that I've gone, I've kind of done that before and I saw a lot of work that was st- stuff that I, well, I wasn't interested in and I've already seen that and why am I going to do it again or why am I going to perform that again or, or, or it's just not interesting. So I decided I wanted to write my own show because I haven't seen, like I said before, I haven't seen me on stage. So I wanted to write and I spoke to uh, a friend of mine, Lee Lewis, who's the artistic director at um, Griffin Theatre Company. And she put, you know, a lot of trust and confidence in me and said, we'll do it. And then I sent her a scene and she went, okay, keep going, keep going. And I was a part of their studio program at Griffin and then... Um, I also sent it to Sam Strong at um, the Queensland Theatre Company and um, Paige Rattray and Isaac Drandage helped me to push that forward and the play ended up, you know, they both both theatre companies commissioned me to put on the show and that became a co-production and um, it's it's just really basically a story about a family dealing with the loss of a, of a very dear loved one and in this case it's about my father so... It's a kind of a love letter to my dad, but it's a love letter to Kalgoorlie. And um, it's also uh, that twist and turn with dealing with the issues of being an Indigenous person in Australia. 
and that's what the play is kind of about. I feel like uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say the play is about racism because that's not what it's about, but it, it, it is discussed because the play is about a family, dealing with loss and how you pick yourselves up and work together to put on a funeral, get together, make sure that the person's healing and that pressure and torment as well. Um, it's a really hard time and unfortunately we're all going to experience it at some point in our lives with both our parents and because they are very close they bring you up in this world and if you're lucky enough to have your parents in your life um or any person that you know um looks after you so it, it's a really difficult time but i wanted to explore that and i i think it's a bit of a confessional as well because I could have handled, um, my dad was very sick for a few years there and I could have did better, you know, and I think everyone has regrets and I think it's dealing with regret and guilt as well, so, um, and it's been, it's been a very cathartic, therapeutic experience doing that and I think, uh, and then, of course, the, unfortunately, the Elijah Dowdy case happened and he was a 14-year-old boy and um it happened in Kalgoorlie and I was like well I'm sick of this you know and so there's stuff in there that it, it, it's delving into that gross uh deep-seated racism that is alive and well and prevalent in Australia um and that's a big undertaking um obviously after the loss of mm. your dad that's uh, the grief of that as you say is mm. I'm lucky enough to still have both of my parents. Mm. So it's it's something I'm going to have to go through. I'm sure I'll learn from um, seeing your play and that experience to, but to go through it and then to Mm. be brave enough to write about it. And now Mm. you're on the, you're in this creative process where you're sitting in this space, um, having these discussions. Um, It's still um, in production. Uh, So it's written, but you're in production. It's not, you know, not out there in the marketplace yet performing for anyone in Queensland, Sydney Mm -hmm. and wherever it will go on to. So Mm. you're going to be on this journey for a a little bit um, longer as well. So it's a a pretty brave call. Yeah, well, I I wanted to make sure that I was um, being vulnerable. And and not only that, I think there are certain, um, certain systematic power at play that I wanted to address. I wanted to address uh, that community. Um, I also wanted to address my own community. And I also wanted to address myself because if I'm going to talk about these people, then I need to make sure that I'm pointing the finger back at myself as well. So there are certain things that I, I, I put on myself in the in the play and I'm trying to be as uh, open and um, transparent as possible. Also, it's a, it's a work of fiction, so obviously there's there's stuff that I have to make. The, who, who am I? Who says my life is interesting? But I also wanted to make sure that there was something in there that gets audiences entertained as well. So hopefully it is entertaining. But I made sure that I wanted to talk about something that was real, really, um, and something that is I'm. I feel like I, I go on Facebook or Twitter and I, I express myself in these little pockets. But I went, no, I'm just going to get this massive amalgamation of all my ideas and I'm going to put it into a play and you, you either listen or you don't. As long as you pay your money, <laughs> come to the show, you can leave it interval if you want to. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And what do you hope um, audience will, audiences will walk away thinking or feeling after it? I, I think the talking about um, change is um, a hopeful one. I'm a cynical person, so unfortunately I feel like um, change is going to take a long time and it's baby steps and we're going at a minuscule snail's pace to get there, but it has to be baby steps because unfortunately they can't handle it. So because whenever we do push our ideas and our, our experience forward, it isn't um, the response isn't always positive. A lot of the time, it's very negative, in because it's always we're always being told to get over it, we're always being told to look what you have, be grateful for what you have. I, I think we're still fighting, and we're going to be fighting for a long time. And like I said before, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a uh, <laughs> cynical person, but I want to be hopeful. I want that change, and I think um, the play asks you, do you care? Um, are you empathetic are you human are you a person Um, 
uh, you, you, you don't have to entirely agree with everything that I said and, and hopefully some things make you think differently but I'm there's no um, there's just a, I'm forcing a conversation and you either take it or leave it I suppose but in that conversation that's where the hope lies in the play I think because it's spoiler alert not very optimistic we look forward to coming to see it <laughs> once you're ready. And um, uh, it's, I don't know if we'll make it up to Brisbane. We'll certainly come and see it when it's here in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and it's a conversation, you know, the best theatre is that uh, the theatre that kind of shines that mirror back mm. on you and you can see yourself as a country and can pay attention to how some of your neighbours, friends are feeling. Yep. Um, it might not directly affect you because you may not think that you know an Aboriginal person mm. or an experience. Um, and this is one way people will get a sense of what that looks like. Yeah. So um, kudos to you <laughs> for um, being so brave and taking such a um, difficult time in your life and really, you know, cracking it open, exploring what that looks like and sharing that story with the world. And we certainly can't yeah. wait to um, see it and, and see the reaction to it. Yeah. I'm sure will be interesting. Yeah. Well, and apparently it's funny too because people keep laughing about it. So, oh. yeah. So, well, the, that's good. There's humour in there too. So, it's not all d- gloom and doom. So. No, because you are very funny. Um, <laughs> I do know that. And uh, Jim Carrey was one of your role models, as you say. And also, you've been on a few great, you know, ads and um, black comedy. Yeah. So, you have a quite a breadth as an actor um, <laughs> to be able to go from really serious personal stories, which are important, mm. but also have a laugh too. It's yeah. a big part of our culture. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, do do you have a favourite? Do you like to move between them? What is that oh, like Oh, look, I feel like um, I versatility is, is something that I, I want to make sure that I'm trying to express in my work and make sure that, you know, I don't want to narrow, be narrow-minded about where I want my uh, the trajectory of my career to go. So, And I love doing comedy. I love doing drama. I love doing all sorts. And if you can get that fine balance of putting both, in any work that you do, then I think you're in um, good stead to, you know, just getting a successful performance. And I, 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 I yeah, I, lo- I love all of mediums really. And c- comedy, you know, it's it's fun. It's more technical because y- you can't play into the comedy, but it's it's fun. And then the drama is, you know, getting down and getting gritty and dirty or whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, they're, they're both, I, lo- I love both. And so what do you hope your body of work will look like? What's kind of, if you could design it moving forward? I'm always trying to take risk and I, I feel like I have taken risks in my career, um, especially being um, a, an Indigenous person, uh, a straight Indigenous person, because in that there lies privileges in, its, in itself because I, um, I've played characters that... Uh, um, I played a gay character on Neighbours yeah. for for two years, and I um, I wanted to make sure I was doing roles and th- stuff that challenged me um, in a way that wasn't a stretch, but it was just something that it, it gets me into a place where I I, I feel like I, I'm I'm making sure I'm st- story storytelling from a very broad view of the world. I feel like um, I, I try and. I try not to repeat myself. I've, I've played the lover in a play at uh, Bell Shakespeare and that was very hard for me to do because it's not what comes naturally to me. I'm always the dark and broody character, but I felt like I don't want to do that all the time. So I, I try and make sure that I'm not, um, you know, shielding myself from the possibilities and the curiosity of 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 work and I, I feel like I, I want to make sure that I'm always get, you know challenging myself and pushing myself into different um, avenues. Any international work interest you? Oh, for sure, for sure. I think um, I was lucky enough to go to Sundance in 2015, um, and you know we, we had Nicole Kidman and Hugo Weaving and Joseph Wines and they were the big names a part of that film, and I got to go over there and I had a role in in in, in that film, so that was. Um, I'd already knocked on that door and I was doing Neighbours at the same time, which, you know, obviously has a big UK um, following. Um, LA's always been knocking on the door, um, but I feel like I, I, I'm starting to get at that age where it, it looks like it, um, where the good roles start to come 
Um, I'm still in that middle, like, is he a young guy or is he, is he a man yet? So I, I feel like um, the work has uh, presented itself in, in those forms, but I, I really want to push into, you know, where the good roles come and that's always, you know, oh, he's a brooding character with stubble on his face and, he, you know, I, I want to get into that kind of, kind of work and I think the American market um, obviously uh, has a platform for diversity and I think Australia hasn't quite gotten there yet. So I think... Obviously, the American market is Hollywood is where I see myself going. I, as long as I give it a try, if I if I if I fail, then at least I attempted. So I want to make sure that I've, I've I've pushed down that avenue. You were our big name at Sundance. Don't really worry <laughs> about those other ones. Um, and I suppose the other kind of question that comes to mind whenever you're kind of talking to an actor. Mm. Um, I I struggle to think about what it's like to play lots of different people and do you get lost in a – how how much do you know yourself and how much of yourself are in other pieces of work is it? um, Yeah, I think um, I I make sure I I try not to go too far into my characters as long as I know who main is, you know. I'm I'm pretty um, secure in myself. Um, I want to push the performance as – real and authentic as I possibly can um but so at, at certain times that there, there I think it's it's the people that know you that show you who you are and I feel like sometimes I've, I've gone with cl- people I'm close to and they've gone whoa you, I know you just come off stage but you're you're acting really erratic or and when I've played an aggressive character or a character that swore every five seconds or something and whoa you need a Go back outside, come to the door as main because I can, I can feel and I can hear what, whoever you're playing or whatever. So uh, sometimes <laughs> I'd like to think that um, i am got most things on an even keel but uh, sometimes I think it does creep in and sometimes your characters can, as long as you're not bringing home the serial killer and you're going, ah! <laughs> um, but I think there's times where um, I, I like to push my performance to a point where it is you know, as as real as it can possibly be, but I, I try to leave my work at the door. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's, it isn't always, it's not always the easiest thing to do. And so what do you like to do outside of your work? So you mentioned a little bit about playing sport when you were younger. Yeah. Um, what does non-acting mean like uh, to get up to? Look, I, I used to love playing basketball and footy when I was younger. What um, footy? AFL, Western Australian. So. <laughs> <laughs> um but I think once I've moved over here and I, I um, because my body is my instrument, yeah, that I, I, I could no longer do that because if I get injured, then I can't go work. So there, it had to be a sacrifice, had to be made, and then I decided, you know, um, I had to give away the basketball and football. But I, um, I look, I've, in the last couple of years, I've, I've tried to be more proactive in um, my... Um, work in the community I've gone to more rallies I've been more vocal about um, my political um, views um, and I've tried to make sure that um, I've used my platform as a positive for our community um, to show that you know um, that y- you can still hold on to your val- values and morals and what you believe in and still have a career. Um, I try I, I try and get down to as many as I possibly can because I think people in the grassroots level and community level, um, I, I'm lucky enough to be an actor, but those guys don't get the recognition that they should. And just because I go down and I get whoever so many views when I'm on a video or something like that, which is great because it's, it's giving those people a platform, but you shouldn't listen to me because I'm saying it. I'm just... I'm just relaying the message that has already been been pushed forward from all these people because they've been doing the hard work. I'm trying as much as I can and trying to um, show support as much as I can but I, and I do love doing that but those people deserve the pat on the back, you know. So um, I try to make sure I use my platform to, for, to push um, positivity about, you know, our community. 
And that's kind of what we wanted to do with The mm. Real, um, both, you know, the <coughs> website and also mm. the podcast so that we can get these stories and just show, have those real conversations, but For also sure. put the positivity out there yeah. and display our people um, in all, all our glory, doing all the different things that we do. Because we're kicking ass. Absolutely, across the board, so many things. So, um, any last bits of advice for any of the young ones who might be listening to the podcast about um, what they can do to stay positive and um, give back to the community? Um, I think in whatever you want to do, be confident, you know? And I think confidence is, it's, it, it isn't always easy. And, um, but I, I, feel, I feel like be confident, not arrogant. I think arrogance is... Um, is not a good thing. I think I think arrogance is negative, and I think negativity. The less negative negativity, then the better. And as long as you have your vision and your dream of what you want to do and what you see, then go for it. And that might change. You know, you might want to. And like I said before about my myself, I wanted to go into broadcasting and 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 sports journalism. And but I went, oh, acting is calling me on this side. So, and that's okay. Um, and it, it's okay to not know what you want to do. And I think. Um, as long as you keep striving and and trying to do your best at everything you do, I think laziness is is something that um, is something that uh, will hold you back. And I, I'm I'm guilty of being lazy at times, but hard work is what is going to is going to get you through the door and get you to where you want to be. And discipline. And I feel like, you know. Whatever's going on in your life, you, you you take that as it comes and you, you do what you, you can. But if you want something, you go for it and, and don't let anybody or anything... Like, go out there and show them that you're equal. You know what I mean? If you're walking through those doors, just just do it, you know? Um, it, it, sometimes it's scary, but life is scary. You know what I mean? And, and you never know if you never go. So, I reckon just go for it, to be honest. Beautiful. Um, and the other question we have to ask is, what is the real Australia to you? The real Australia. What is the real Australia to me? I I I feel like it's um, this uh, the beautiful country that we have. You know what I mean? I I think it's it's our um, it's the land. I think that's I think that's the real Australia. I think I live in Sydney, but I live in an urban environment with, you know, concrete jungle. But the real Australia is is the land and the stories that that holds and the um, significance that that holds and the the country informing who you are and bringing you back down to who you really are. Um, that story, that song line, I feel I, th- I feel like that that is the real Australia. Um, I feel like I, I live in a. Um, I think people m- misconstrue that I, I live in a glamorous world because I'm an actor or whatever, but it, it's it's not real, you know. Being in a foyer or being on the red carpet is fun, but it's not real, you know. Um, sitting down with a, a a loved one, a person, uh, a friend, uh, a stranger, and having a conversation that's real. That's real. I think I think those connections are important. I think those things are real, and seeing people and acknowledging who they are and accepting who they are together is is, is real. I, I, I feel like uh, negativity. I feel like um, closing off to things that you don't understand or is 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 not real. I, I, I feel like this image of what Australia is and blah, 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 is fake. I feel like that, that image of Chuck the Shrimp on the Barbie is fake. Um, I, I, I feel like, uh, like I said before about evolving, I think, I, think, think, I think Australian culture has evolved and I feel like more people are... are uh, the story is still, there's a push and pull going on at the moment in the current um, uh, environment. Because there's a, there's a big right uh, nationalist view going on, but there's also a big when you go when you go see a rally in Melbourne and there's like thousands of people walking the streets together. That that's that's encouraging, you know. And I feel that's real. I think I think um, 
I, yeah, I, I, I feel like that's, I think that's real Australia, you know. Um, I think that's a very good description. <laughs> um, and lots of levels too, mm. so and very well thought through and shares your knowledge and experience mm. as you walk on this land yeah. um, in your current, you know, um, spot in life. And uh, we're just really grateful that you came and shared your story with us. No, thank you. Thank you for allowing me um, to come Is there talk. anything else we haven't talked about that you want to perhaps touch on? I think a lot of people know your general kind of pieces of work. Yeah. I, I was just interested to hear more in the, the background and your passions and the next kind of phase. Yeah, no, I, I think... Um, I'm going to see how my, my play goes and that, you know, that's in June, July, August, you know, this year. So I feel like um, the response of that and hopefully, um, like the, the, the responses have been positive so far and the developments and the workshops and stuff like that. And I think um, a lot of black followers who've been involved in that creative experience have been very positive about it and that's encouraging and that's, they're the community that I really want to, you know, make sure I'm I'm hitting the nail on the head. But I feel I, I, not only that. I think um, non-Indigenous Australia are ready to wake up because they've been asleep for over two hundred thirty years. So I feel like they're ready to wake up. Well, I hope they wake up this June, July, <laughs> and thank yeah. good luck with the play. No, thank uh, you very much. We look forward to seeing it, and we'll make sure we'll give it a big plug as well. Yeah, come and have a look. Come, come down. Make sure you get along and see it, um, everyone. And thank you, Maine White, for coming in and having a chat with The Real. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to The Real podcast series. The Real is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander digital media platform produced by 33 Creative. This episode was recorded in Sydney on Gadigal Country. Produced by Jake Keane and Marguerite Barbara. Music production by Jimbler. For more stories and podcasts, visit the-real.com.au forward slash podcast. 